Our story begins in Azalea Town. On the evening before Ash Ketchum's 10th birthday, tomorrow he will be eligible to go on his Pokemon adventure. And more importantly, his grandpa Kurt has promised that tomorrow morning he will finally show the boy the secret behind why he is known as the greatest Apricorn Pokeball maker in the world. But before all that, he has his family birthday dinner back home. Saying goodbye to his childhood friend Bugsy and thanking him for the vial of silver powder, Ash heads home. However, to his surprise, when he arrives, he sees Officer Jenny's squad car parked out front. Heading inside, he hears the sound of voices coming from the dining room, and so listens through the door. Officer Jenny is the one speaking now, and in a tired voice, she says, Tetsuya has been spotted in the area. There's no chance you've... But before she can finish, Kurt bursts out angrily, asking if the police officer is suggesting he's still in contact with Tetsuya. Or worse, he's been harboring him. Jenny is at a loss for words, having not expected such anger from the old man, and so Kurt reels it in, though there is still a heavy overtone of bitterness as he growls that he treated that boy like a son, taught him everything he knew about old-fashioned pokeball making, and how did Tetsuya thank him? He brought the craft into disrepute with his monstrous creation. Officer Jenny apologizes profusely for upsetting Kurt, saying she can clearly see he has nothing to do with Tetsuya's recent activities. She then heads for the door, and Ash has to leap away to avoid making it obvious that he was eavesdropping. However, the guilty look on his face when Jenny steps into the hallway is enough of a giveaway. Since Azalea is such a small town, Jenny has known Ash for all his life, and so pressing a finger to her lips, she winks to say that this will be their little secret, before wishing him a happy birthday and departing. Stepping into the dining room, Ash greets his grandfather, who in turn welcomes him home, asking if he's had a good day. Ash smiles that he has, before adding that what would make it a great day is if his grandpa showed him the secret of Pokeball making tonight. Sternly, but with no real anger, Kurt chides that the boy needs to learn patience. He said tomorrow morning, so tomorrow morning it shall be. Moments later, Ash's mum Delia and little cousin Maisie arrive home, arms piled high with supplies for the big dinner, with Ash's cake wobbling precariously on top of Maisie's stack. Smiling, Ash takes the bags and boxes from her, helping his mum to pack them away. As they work, Delia looks fondly at her son, saying she can't believe he's old enough to go out into the world by himself. Chuckling, Ash tells her he's going to be fine, but Delia is not satisfied with such a laissez-faire answer, and so for the umpteenth time, begins to lecture him about changing his underwear and not eating strange berries he finds lying around. Finally, it is time for dinner, all Ash's old favourites, and the family of four laugh and joke, raising a glass to Ash and wishing him luck in his journey. After cake, it comes time for presents. Maisie gives Ash a beautifully illustrated book about all of Johto's legendary Pokemon, with concept art of what they might look like done by Professor Oak himself. Smiling, Ash promises that he'll meet them all and show them this book, an idea which makes the little girl smile. Ash's mother gives him a new set of clothes for travelling, including a stylish new cap to keep the sun off his face, while Kurt smiles that he'll give Ash his present in the morning, after showing him the secret. After that, the family split up to do their own things, with Ash reading his new book and listening to DJ Mary on Goldenrod Radio. However, this is just a distraction, since the conversation between his grandpa and Officer Jenny is still gnawing at the back of his mind. Though it's been many years since he left in disgrace, Ash still remembers Tetsuya. He was his grandpa's apprentice, and the most gifted Pokeball craftsman Kurt had ever seen. However, one day when Ash was little, Tetsuya made something that got Kurt really upset. So much so that he threw him out of the house, and said that he never wanted to see him again. Ash never found out what it was that Tetsuya did, but it must have been pretty bad, since neither his mother nor grandpa ever spoke about it, or him. These thoughts plague Ash even into sleep, with dreams of Tetsuya riding on a giant apricorn ball that is trying to catch and eat him disrupting his rest, and forcing Kurt to come and wake him since he's sleeping late. The sun is well and truly in the sky when Kurt gruffly tells Ash that he thought he wanted to see the secret, and if he sleeps too much longer it'll be too late. This is just the wake-up call Ash needs, and so throwing on his new clothes, he allows his grandpa to lead him into the forest behind their house. Ash isn't afraid of this place, having played here with Maisie ever since he was little, but he had always known not to go past the fence line, since powerful, dangerous, wild Pokemon lived beyond. However, today's grandpa jumps the fence like it's nothing, and tells Ash to follow. With a little bit of trepidation, Ash does so, following his grandpa down a well-worn forest path leading towards a thick copse of trees. 
This seems to be their destination, since as they approach it, Kurt begins to tell Ash a story. He says that once long ago, their family lived in a place called Hisui, far to the north of what is now Johto. Back then, they were part of a tribe called the Diamond Clan, who lived in harmony with the Pokemon of the region. Among them were certain Pokemon called Noble Pokemon, who reigned over whole areas of Hisui, and each Noble Pokemon had a warden, who was their loyal human attendant and partner. His grandpa Melly was one of these wardens, looking after the Lord of the Coronet Highlands, Electrode. This surprises Ash, who says that he wouldn't have thought Voltorb and Electrode existed back then, since they're based off Pokeballs. Kurt sighs that like most young people, Ash has it backwards. Pokeballs are based off Voltorb and Electrode, not the other way around. However, he is partially correct that Voltorb and Electrode as they are now did not exist. The Voltorb and Electrode of Hisui were actually grass electric types, made of a wood very similar to apricorns, and it was through the study of them that the settlers from other regions were able to develop the initial Pokeballs that they used during their exploration. Eventually, the Diamond Clan and the Settlers came together to form a new people, blending the ways of the old and the new. And during this time, the Noble Electrode of the day taught humans how to create the seven types of apricorn balls that are still used to this day. Turning on a dime, Kurt then sternly asks Ash what these seven types are, in the tone of a teacher. At first, Ash is taken aback at this sudden shift in tone, but when Kurt gives him an even sterner look, evidently thinking Ash has forgotten the answer, the boy hastily speaks up, reciting the lessons that have been drilled into him since birth. The seven types of the Heavy Ball, made from black apricorns which catch heavy Pokemon, the Lure Ball, made from blue apricorns which catch water Pokemon, the Friend Ball, made from green apricorns which make Pokemon like their trainer faster, the Love Ball, made from pink apricorns which catch Pokemon of the opposite gender from your Pokemon, the Level Ball, made from red apricorns which catch weaker Pokemon, the Fast Ball, made from white apricorns which catch fast Pokemon, and the Moon Ball, made from yellow apricorns which catch Pokemon who evolve with Moonstone. Kurt claps Ash on the back when he is finished, saying he's done a good job, then tells him that all those balls were created thanks to the hard work of the Noble Electrode, its Warden, and the scientists of the Galaxy team. However, as time went on, humans lost their respect for the past, favouring the ease of the future, and so one by one the Wardens abandoned their posts, and the Nobles died out. Ash says that's horrible, asking if even great-great-grandpa Melly betrayed Electrode. Chuckling a little, Kurt shakes his head, saying that Grandpa Melly never was one to bend to public opinion, and so he alone stayed loyal, though it quickly became clear that the time of Electrode's reign was at an end. For that reason, he and Electrode left Hisui for a new colony further down south. That place eventually became the Johto region, where Melly was able to find love and eventually form roots right here in Azalea Town. Ash, however, is more curious about Electrode, asking what happened to it. Kurt solemnly replies that it eventually passed away, though not before siring a son who he would very much like for Ash to meet. He then guides Ash into the thicket, and seated comfortably in the center is a giant electrode made out of wood just like he said. Smiling, Kurt greets his old friend, rubbing its domed head, which makes the big Pokemon rumble happily. The old Pokeball artisan then introduces Ash, saying that he is his grandson, while in turn telling Ash that this is his best friend, and his master in the art of building apricorn balls. Ash greets the noble Pokemon with a smile, and Electrode rolls over to give the boy a friendly nudge, seemingly signifying his approval of his old friend's grandson. Still smiling, Kurt says he hopes he now knows why this place has been held in such secrecy, and why Ash in turn must now keep the secret, since Electrode may be the last of its kind, and it could spell disaster if the wrong people were to learn of its existence. Ash promises that he won't tell a soul, and Kurt nods, saying he knows he won't. That is why he would like to ask a favour of Ash. Ash asks what he can do for his grandpa, and Kurt says that Electrode's time is coming to an end, but it too is sired a son, and it would mean the world to both Kurt and Electrode if Ash would take it as his partner, and help it grow so that one day it can become a noble as great as its father and grandfather. Ash promises to do so, and out of the trees rolls a smaller orb, with one half red, while the other shows a wood pattern. Kurt introduces the Pokemon as Voltorb, and Ash beams, crouching down to hug it, and promising that they're going to be the best of friends. Voltorb gives a happy chirp, and sends a faint jolt up its new trainer's arms as a sign of excitement. Kurt then clears his throat, saying it's now time for his gift, and from his kimono he draws a handcrafted leather belt, engraved with Ash's name, and carrying one of each of the seven apricorn balls Ash listed earlier. 
Smiling, he wishes Ash a happy birthday, and stoically accepts the boy's grateful hug. He then continues that traditionally wardens would not keep their lords in pokeballs, but to avoid someone else catching it, Kurt believes it is best if Ash at least formally catches Voltorb in one of these balls. Ash asks which one, and Kurt points to the fast ball, saying even back in his sweet times, Voltorb were known for their speed. Crouching down, Ash asks Voltorb if it's okay being captured, promising to let it out as soon as he's done it, and with a cheerful nod, Voltorb agrees. Lightly the boy bonks the ball on the head, capturing it, then good to his word lets it out again, smiling that that wasn't so bad, was it? Behind him, Kurt nods that this is all very good, that we should give Ash one last warning. Noble Pokemon have the potential for great power thanks to their deep devotion to their friends and home, but because of that, they also have the potential for terrible fury, which when channeled outwards can wreak terrible vengeance. Nonchalantly, Ash tells his grandpa that he has nothing to worry about there, since his and Voltorb's journey is going to be nothing but smiles all the way. Scowling, Kurt calls this the arrogance of a callow youth, but beside him Electrode gives the old man a nudge as if to ask, were we any different when we were their age? With this matter settled, Ash, Kurt, and Voltorb return to the house where Delia and Maisie are waiting for them. Delia gives her son an approving nod now that he is in on the secret too, while Maisie toddles over to touch Voltorb, saying that its big eyebrows look kinda weird. Without missing a beat, Voltorb electrocutes the girl, dropping her on her back, suggesting that its appearance may be a touchy subject. Ash lightly chides Voltorb, saying it can't go around electrocuting people, even if they say rude things, to which Voltorb gives an apologetic look. Rising to her feet and smoothing her now frazzled hair, Maisie says it's alright and gives the electric type a pat on the head, saying that she thinks it's cool and super strong. Delia then asks Ash where he and Voltorb are going next, and Ash grins that isn't it obvious? To challenge Bugsy. Arriving at the gym while Voltorb merrily rolls alongside him, Ash calls out to the newly appointed gym leader, saying that just like he promised, now that they both have Pokemon, they're going to have a battle. Grinning Bugsy appears from one of the trees that line his battlefield and says that he'd love to. He then says that since Ash only got his first Pokemon today, he's going to bend the rules a little and make this a one-on-one, -on -one, though he knows Ash won't tell on him. Ash jokes that it depends on if he wins or not, then as one, the two childhood friends take up positions on either side of the battlefield. Since becoming a gym leader a few months back, Ash and Bugsy haven't had as much time to hang out as they used to, but the grandson of Kurt still knows the bug specialist well enough to predict which of his Pokemon he'll bring out, and so is not surprised in the slightest to see Scyther. Bugsy wouldn't disrespect Ash's first battle with anything less than his all, and that means starter versus starter, even if Bugsy's is a bit more experienced. Ash then calls for Voltorb, and the little orb comes rolling onto the field, with Bugsy commenting that it's so cool he got a Voltorb, though it does look a little odd. This only fuels Voltorb's drive for battle, and so when Ash's command begins rolling at top speed, then launches itself at Scyther with tackle. Scyther deftly flies out of the way, then retaliates with a super effective Fury Cutter, which to the gym leader's surprise does more damage than he had expected. Giving Ash a quizzical look, the young challenger explains that his Voltorb is actually part grass, meaning it's weak to bug moves. Bugsy grins that that does explain the odd appearance, though no matter, since if it's a grass type, his scythe is going to mow it down. He then calls for scythe to use Fury Cutter again, while Ash has Voltorb use Thundershock. Though this is the weakest electric move, Voltorb is able to fire it off for decent damage thanks to Scyther's typing. Nonetheless, Scyther manages to push through, dealing another powerful blow of its own which sends Voltorb rolling backwards. Bugsy then calls for Scyther to finish things with a final Fury Cutter, and this panics Ash, who in his inexperience as a battler, simply cries for Voltorb to do something. Voltorb pulls out the only move it hasn't used yet, that being Magical Leaf. Scyther doesn't even bother cutting these, as Bugsy remarks how his friend should know better than to rely on a move his Pokemon is quad resistant to, and with that declaration, the hammer falls, or in this case, the Scythe, as Scyther's bladed claw connects with Voltorb, sending it spinning into a wall, where it collapses unconscious. As Ash walks over to pick Voltorb up, Bugsy tells him that that wasn't a bad first attempt, but he needs to remember to keep his head during battle, since his Pokemon will be looking to him for guidance. Ash nods and turns to leave, but before he can go, Bugsy suggests that when Voltorb is feeling better, they should do some training in Ilex Forest, since it has lots of bug types who will be good practice for when he wants to challenge Scyther again. Ash thanks his friend for the suggestion, then heads over to the Pokemon Center. 
After an hour of Nurse Joy's care, Voltorb is back on its feet, figuratively speaking, and just like Ash is raring to get down to training. At Bugsy's recommendation, they head into Ilex Forest, where Ash immediately asks Voltorb to show him all the moves it knows. As it turns out, its moveset is Thundershock, Tackle, and Magical Leaf. A fairly diverse set, but if Ash is not mistaken, Pokemon can know up to four moves, meaning there is still one free slot to fill. Excitedly, Ash suggests that Voltorb should learn a Fire-type move, since then it would cream Bugsy's Bug-types. But rocking back and forth, Voltorb shakes its head to say that this would be beyond its capabilities. Ash sighs alright, how about a flying type move? But this only earns him a look that says, yeah sure, I'll just use those wings I totally have. Laughing, Ash concedes that maybe they should shelve the new move idea for now, and work on powering up what they already have. This at last seems to earn Voltorb's approval, as it rolls in a circle around its trainer, eager to train with him. Unfortunately, Ash doesn't really know how to train, and so after a moment of deep thought, suggests they go further into the forest, since maybe they'll run into another trainer, or even just a wild bug type like Bugsy said. And so Ash and Voltorb make their way deeper in, with Ash occasionally having to carry Voltorb over the more uneven patches of ground. It is slow going, but with all the trees blocking most of the sunlight, there is a timeless feel to this place, where they could have been here for 10 minutes or 10 hours. Finally, up ahead they hear the sound of battle, with claws clashing against claws, and the high-pitched cry of a Sneasel ringing out. Rushing to check it out, Ash excitedly wonders what great training he and Voltorb are going to have, only for his blood to run cold when he sees the trainer commanding the Sneasel, Tetsuya. Even beneath his golden half-mask, Ash has no trouble recognizing his grandfather's former apprentice, and so snarls out the man's name. Tetsuya, better known now as the Iron Masked Marauder, turns to face Ash, and a cruel smile crosses his thin lips. In a mocking voice, he greets Ash, asking if the kid's finally gotten sick of Kurt's scowling and run away. Ash doesn't even dignify this with a response, instead barking that Tetsuya needs to turn himself in, since he's causing his grandpa all kinds of trouble. Officer Jenny even came to their house. This makes the Iron Mask Marauder laugh, saying he would have loved to see his puckered old face when the cops questioned him. Meanwhile, the battle between his Sneasel and a wild Scyther has come to an end, with the Scyther being thoroughly demolished despite its size advantage. As the bug type slumps against a tree, Tetsuya throws a Pokeball that Ash doesn't recognize, pure black with iron bands around it which sucks Scyther in with a torrent of dark energy before returning to the man's hand. When he sees Ash looking, the Marauder chuckles that it's impressive, isn't it? It's called a Dark Ball, and it's his own design. Any Pokemon caught in one grows to the highest level, while also turning pure evil and completely loyal to its master's commands. The perfect weapon. Ash growls this must be what his grandpa meant when he said Tetsuya brought the craft of Pokeball making into disrepute, but the man spits back that he revolutionized it, and that old fool couldn't even recognize greatness when it was right in front of him. They could have been partners, but instead he cast him out. But none of that matters now, since soon Kurt will see the power of the Dark Ball for himself. Smirking, the Iron Mask Marauder then strolls towards Ash, menace all over his face. Voltorb, sensing this, rolls forward to defend its trainer, but with a cruel laugh, Tetsuya kicks it away into a tree. Frantically, Ash cries out Voltorb's name, but the Marauder does not like being ignored, snarling at Ash to keep his eyes on him, then punching him squarely in the stomach. As Ash crumples, Tetsuya leans in to whisper in his ear, telling him to pass on a message to his grandfather. He is coming for his precious electrode, and if Kurt, Ash, or anyone else stands in his way, they won't live to regret it. And that's where we'll leave things. What evil scheme has Tetsuya hatched to capture Lord Electrode? Will Ash be able to stop him? And can our young hero stand up to the terrible might of the Dark Ball? Find out as the journey continues.